As they say, brace for the G's. Today is going to be, you want me to get through as much of this as possible. You don't want lab to be your introduction. Today is so terrifying, we're only doing one topic. That's my math. So again, 61, get rid of methionine, get rid of tryptophan. I had three codons, or tRNAs for isolutes because I had three codons. Got me 56, I just divided it by two. 28, added those three back. 31. What else could you have done? Could you not have just counted them? One more time? No. That's one tRNA. That's the job of the eye. The eye makes one tRNA for them all. Today is one of those topics where I guarantee you it's one of those where you blink a little too long because daylight saving time is getting you a little too hard. It will go from I'm following, I'm following, I don't know what's happening. That is today. Because this is a topic you have, if you've learned of it before, you learned of its name and that was it. We're going to talk epistasis today. So the big idea is you can have two genes and they're going to interact with each other. Meaning, one gene is going to manipulate the phenotype of the other gene. We have genes manipulating other phenotypes. It is a form of genetic interference. Again, epistasis is one gene masking or modifying another phenotype. The way that we hunt this down or smell it out is we need to hunt for a deviation from the dihybrid cross 9331 for the phenotype ratio. Everything we're going to do is vary off of that 9331. How can you vary? Well, if I were to take, for example, these two here and add them up, I can make a 4. I can get a ratio of 9 to 3 to 4. There's an explanation for that. Or I can take the 9 and the 3 and make a 12 to 3 to 1 ratio. Or I can take the 3, the 3, and the 1 and make a 9 to 7 ratio. Or I can make other ones like a 9 to 6 to 1. I can make a 15 to 1. There's a 15 to 0. There's a 13 to 3. We can make all sorts of different combinations based upon how these genes are interacting with each other. The challenge of this week's lab is you're going to look at an actual example with corn. And all you're going to do is look at the color of corn kernels. And it turns out its genetics turn out to be complicated. They follow this epistasis thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through some of these patterns and we're going to see how can we make sense of these. So one version is what we call complementary genes or complementary action. So when we think of the complement test, what we mean is you need two genes to get the full phenotype in this particular case. Both genes need to be working to see the final outcome. What would this look like? Well, if I were to take a dihybrid, so big A, little a, big B, little b, and cross it, what I would expect to get is a 9, 3, 3, 1 ratio, where this is the dominant A, dominant B phenotype. This would be one of the dominants. Here's the other dominant. Then the one is the double recessive. What we are suggesting by complementary action, you don't necessarily need to remember that complement, complementary action means 9 to 7. That's kind of a dumb thing to remember. But 
if you were to look and you were to see with Harabelle flowers that these ones here make a blue color, all of these make white colors, that would be a 9 to 7 ratio. You should be able to explain what's going on. How did I get a 9 to 7 ratio? Step number one is always, how can I make a 9 to 7 ratio? The answer is, well, I know a 3, a 3, and a 1 all collectively add up to the 7. That's always going to be the first step, is I see the ratio. How could I add up 9, 3, 3, and 1 to make that ratio? We're never going to break up the 9 into different compartments. It's always going to be 9, 3, 3, and 1. And how can I rearrange these parts? How can we explain this? Well, the easiest way is to make like a schematic of it. In lab, you're going to be shown how to do schematics, but also like a flow chart, so a series of yeses and nos. Yes and no diagrams make sense when we know the pathway, and in lab, you'll see how it all works out. Here, we don't know the components, so it's really hard to do that, so I'm going to have to do this weird little side diagram. So if I have this as my situation, both are recessive, meaning both phenotypes are recessive. So I'm going to get no functioning blue color. Okay, got it. What if I had one of these having a dominant? The blank again means dealer's choice, what goes there. Put a dominant, put a recessive, who cares? Well, if I need both enzymes A and B to get the blue coloration, what color would this be? White. We didn't get all the way to the blue color. Well, what if we had this situation? Or again, fill in the blank is dealer's choice, big B or low B. If I need both to get all the way to the color blue, this case here, it's still white. It's only when both of them are together with a capital or dominant A and a dominant B that I get my color blue. Because I, I can't distinguish between the double recessive one of the two genes being recessive, the other one not being, and the reciprocal, meaning make the other gene recessive. I can't tell any of those three apart. They all have the same phenotype. When that's the case, when we need all or both of the genes to have a dominant in order to see the full phenotype, this is what we call complementary action. In terms of an enzymatic scheme, this would be, you know, substrate one, you need enzyme A, the second substrate, do enzyme B to get the final product. Where the final product is where the blue is. Everything else, if I can't make it all the way, oops, sorry, you're not blue. Bless you. This is going to be one of the interactions in your lab this week. Just letting you know right now, this is one of them. The easy giveaway, especially because if you look, I pointed out three of them. Those are the three that show up in lab. That's why. The giveaway that you're dealing with complementary gene action is, how many numbers do we have to deal with? Two. How many phenotypes are you looking at? Two. For recessive and dominant, you're looking at three. Big giveaway as to what's going on in lab. Oh, I only see two colors. <gasps> I think I know which one we have. Let's pick the one that has two interactions, or that only gives me two phenotypes. And again, that's because we have some type of enzymatic pathway and we need both working to get to the color at the end. Golden retrievers. Or uh, 
Labradors, excuse me. Because the golden may be gold, and then Nidum to retriever. Is it better to have purebred dogs or mutts? Yes. Okay. As long as we have that. RE, recessive epistasis. What this is, is you require one of the genes to get all the way to the final phenotype but you can negatively impact the second gene's function. Here's what we mean by that. So if I look at the Labrador, the full recessive turns out to be the golden lab. The one that has one dominant turns out to be the chocolate, and the double dominant is the black lab. Diagrammatically, it looks like this. We'll have little a, little a, little b, little b. This will be our golden lab. That's a gene. One of these two genes needs to be the one that's needed for the other. Meaning, we could do our same little weird setup that we had before. Let's just say you need A or B to function. So what does that mean? If I look at this one here, A can function on its own. Who cares what's going on with B? This one here, I don't have a functioning A, but I have a B. Is B going to be expressed? Nope. No. Literally, the A is interfering with B. The term epistasis means standing upon something else. Stasis is where you stand. Epi is on top. It is literally the recessive that is holding back B from being expressed. So this genotype here, this bottom one, would be a golden lab. Because literally the A, the, re the recessive A, is stopping that dominant B from being expressed. How would that happen? An example would be, let's say B, big B means you're going to make the color. You're going to make the pigment. A is going to be, I'm going to put the pigment into the hair. Well, I can make all the pigment I want. If I don't have the ability to put the pigment into the hair, it doesn't matter that you have pigment or not. The lack of the ability to and put that pigment into those cells, shuts down and overrides anything else going on. The recessive controls whether the second dominant allele is allowed to be shown or not. That's why this is a recessive epistasis. It's the recessive that's interfering with a dominant. So in this particular case here, we'll put some type of color down, because usually it's not just from one spot. So we would call this one a chocolate lab. But if we had both fully, or at least both allele, or both genes have a dominant allele being expressed, we would have a black lab. If I look at it in terms of how the ratios work, the ratios are 9. 3, 3, and 1, because that's just how the dihybrid cross works. Last week I showed you how to do that. Hopefully you could if you had to draw it. So if I were to look at these ratios, I have 4 that are the golden. I have 3 for the chocolate. I have 9 
for the black of a 9-3-4 ratio. I showed you this from last week when we dealt with the allelic series. And what we figured out, this particular case here is sun red was dominant to pink. Here, sun red was dominant to, nope, to orange. Here, orange is dominant to pink. So we have this series here. I said we, we were going to ignore this last cross until later. Today is later. So for this one here, we're told parents, we get an F1, then we get an F2. If I look at this right here, the question is, what is that ratio? It's clearly not 9331. So it's, can I see it as anything else? Well, hmm. if I look at these two numbers here, they're close-ish. Not identical, but one of them looks a little bit bigger than the other. Also, this small one, if I multiply it by 3, or sorry, not by 3, yeah, by 3, it's about the size of the biggest one. What ratio would that be? Well, something three times bigger, that'd be like a nine and a three, and a four is slightly bigger than a three. That's a nine to four to three ratio. So, God, how do we solve this problem? So, I now have to start backtracking in my mind as to, well, how could I ever get a nine to three to four, or nine to four to three to one? Well, that happens because I have a variant of the 9331. The only way I can get 9331 is that sucker right there needs to be big A, little a, big B, little b. That's how I get that one. The question then becomes, well, what, what's going on over here with these ones? So I need to do a cross where usually, so you know, the assumption is we usually assume the parents are true breeding, unless you're asked to figure out something about the parents. So usually we assume that they're true breeding. So I need to have something cross something to give me big A, little a, big B, little b. Well, that could be all dominant cross all recessive. For these problems, that's usually not going to be the case. Bless you. It's instead going to be a little a, little a, big B, big B, cross. Perfect. Because that cross will get you that. Which means, I'm told that I'm crossing the orange. Oh, orange is A with a superscript O. Which means this here needs to be O, O. And somehow this combination here is the, what was it, scarlet? Yeah, scarlet. But if I get the both dominants showing up, that's how the yellow appears. So provide a genetic explanation for this. Well, I have a 9 to 4 to 3 ratio. How can we explain this? This is only possible because... Helps if I can spell the word recessive. A recessive phenotype is epistatically inhibiting the expression 
of the other gene. So typically, when you're asked to explain what's going on, a sentence saying what type of interaction is going on, if you don't remember that it's called recessive epistasis, you can say, oh, but I know that it's a recessive that's like interfering with something else, which is effectively saying it's recessive epistasis. You can describe what's going on. But what you also need to do is provide genotypes. Oh, crap. How are we going to figure out genotypes? Well, again, the 9331, there's the yellow, there's the scarlet, and there's the orange. So I need to just start assigning some things. Well, the one is easy. I know what to write for one. I'd write A superscript O, A superscript O, little b, little b. For that three, what should we do with the A's? What do you think? Are we throwing a dominant in there? What do you think? Probably smarter to do it that way. Because I have that orange bit right there. I've maintained the oranginess. I just don't know what's coming after that big B. So that means for the scarlet, what does it have to be? It needs to be a capital A in there, I don't know what comes next, then two little b's. I have no data to make me think there's an allelic series with the little b, so I just leave it as little b's. So the yellow has to be dominant of each. They're my genotypes. So I would expect a sentence and what are the genotypes? Which now means if I were to ask you, this would be really mean, what's that cross? Write out the genotypes of the first cross. You would say, if they're true breeding, it'd be A, S, R, A, S, R, cross A, P, A, P, and then I would mark you wrong. And you'd say, why? I wrote it right. The problem is you're missing something. We need to reference what's going on with some Bs. So I have nothing to make me think that it's big Bs or little Bs, so commit. Do you want to use dominants or recessives? Sure, OK. Done. Just because these are true breeding, you'd have to make sure that they're homozygous. That's it. Because strictly speaking, there's two different genes involved. Only one of them matters. But technically, it does belong there. Because later on, I define the orange as having bees. And since I later define that, I need to reinsert it. If you never did part, or if we never dealt with that fourth cross, I wouldn't have known to put bees there, so I wouldn't have. It's that fourth cross that messes up my answers to the previous ones. This is honestly, so for those of you who are like, I think I get it, I think I get it, congratulations because this is probably the hardest concept that we tackle. And it's one of those where I remember the first time I learned it when I took genetics, it was a, huh? OK, sure, whatever. And you do the problems, and you get half of them right and half of them wrong, or whatever it was. And you're like, oh, OK, but I think I get it. I think I get it. Then grad student here, we do the lab on it, except we do worse ratios than what we show you here. And it was, oh, I think I get it. I think I get it until I tried to do the problems myself. And it was an immediate, 
I have no clue. No clue what's going on. So if you have a feeling of, I'm, I feel lost, you are normal. This is weird, weird stuff. Dominant epistasis, B for dominant, is when one gene is required for the full phenotype, but you can get partials if the other one isn't up to snuff. Meaning, one equals full phenotype. So if you have a dominant A, you'll get the full phenotype. But if you have a dominant B, you'll get a partial phenotype, assuming there's no dominant A. That's what I mean. So foxglove gives us uh, medicine for hearts. So dark pink is dominant to light pink and to white. So how would we draw this one out? Double recessive, which is our white color. If I were to break this up into our normal two. Again, it doesn't matter which one you pick to be the full dominant one. It doesn't really matter. But down here I wrote big A, so let's go with this one. This one big A is all we need for the full phenotype. Which means this one is dark pink. The bottom, we don't get a full phenotype. But we can get a partial. So we don't get the darkest of pink, but we can at least get some pink, which is why it's light pink. And obviously, if I have it all blended together, so I have two dominant alleles, dominant A and a dominant B, this one here is obviously also dark pink. If I look, 9, 3, 3, 1. There's my 1. There's my 3. And there is my 12. So if I had a problem you would assign the phenotype, or excuse me, the genotypes to the phenotype just like what we did up here. So does that apply to like problems where we don't even know what the, what's going on? Of course it does. So pure breeding strain of squash produces disc-shaped fruits that are crossed. So we have disc-shaped cross with Pure breeding strain of long fruits. F1 have disc shaped fruits. The F2, so again we have disc, cross, long. There's my parentals. I get my F1, which are discs. But I'm going to self them. I'm going to get sphere, 178 sphere, 32 long. 270 disc. What's going on here? Oh, God. Well, that doesn't look like a 12, 3, 1. Definitely doesn't look 12, 3, 1. Doesn't look 9, 3, 4. Definitely not 9, 3, 3, 1. So what could it be? So again, we're looking for variance on 9, 3, 3, 1. So I'm going to just take the smallest number, and I'm going to see how it divides into other things, just to have some giggles. Let's see if it does anything. So the smallest number is 32. That sounds like 30 to me. I have 270, and I have 178. Even though somehow I flipped the numbers around, but you know what I mean. Uh, how many times does 30 go into 270? Nine. 
That's like saying how many times does 3 go into 27? 178, that's a gross number. Uh, 180. 180 sounds scary, so 18. 18 divided by 3 is 6. Is that a possible ratio? If you look, there's a 1, there's a 9, there's a 6. Ah, we got one. Propose an explanation for these results. Well, let's see how we can draw, diagram it out. Little a, little a, little b, little b. This will be long. That 6 is between these two here. So between there and there, we both get the sphere shape. Both of them are giving me the same answer. How's that possible that A and B can give me the same answer? The only way I can think of that to work is maybe A and B kind of do the same thing. They both do the same pathway. It's just one of them is a slight variant of whatever it is. So what if A and B have basically the same function? Well, that would explain it. If they had the same function, we would call it being redundant. And obviously, if we have both of them, we would get disk shaped. There would be my 9. Is that, in fact, a, ra a ratio that exists? Well, let's just go back to the beginning. Let's just fact check ourselves. Is 961 a choice? Oh, I always make this assumption, so sometimes I'm just wrong with my assumption. These are all out of 16, yes? So if they're all out of 16, let's just ignore the 16. Let's just look at the numerators. What do you see? I see a 961 right here. 961. Just ignore the 16. Like 9331 is this one, just ignore the out of 16. Hooray. So this must work. Okay, good for us. So what we can get are some weirder interactions. So a truly redundant gene, where they both really actually factually do the same thing, gets us a 15 to 1 ratio. We can have ones where they both kind of make the intermediate the same way, so they're kind of like the same function, but they only give us an intermediate. That'll get us this 9, 6 to 1. We have a really weird version that we used to do in lab, but we don't, which is called dominant suppression. And that's where a dominant allele stops the expression of the other dominant allele. And you get 13 of one phenotype and three of the other. And the other is basically when it doesn't function. We could even get a lethal combo, which turns out to be a 15-0. The basic idea of all of this, again, is I can take my 9331 and I can rearrange them in whatever order I can. Just adding up 9, 3, 3, and 1 in different combinations. The hardest part 
is figuring out what you think that ratio is, and then can you assign it to the four basic genotypes? That is the challenge of this week's lab, is can you match them up? So this one here, we'll do this one, maybe for extra credit, at the start of class on Wednesday. 